Since this is, I guess that doesn't work. Well, we don't have to work. Um, this is tax signal, so I'm going to talk about the IRS. One of the things I left out with insulin signaling, this is just a little addition, because I don't want you to go forward to my class and not know about this. They'll go, oh, I, I know about insulin signaling, and they go, well, you know about IRS. And you go, no. That's, that would be sad. All right, so here's a cell. Okay, this is, uh, what's an insulin target cell? What's a good target cell for insulin? Skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle. That consumes most of your glucose after meal, and it stores glycogen, and you can reuse it later, okay? Uh, so this is skeletal muscle. What does the, the uh, insulin receptor look like? First of all, it's got an alpha chain, and it's got two alpha chains. And it's got a beta chain that spans the membrane, okay? And these are all attached to each other uh, via disulfide bridges, okay? So it's really strongly attached. Um, and so, but that's not the, the interesting thing about this. Uh, it is kind of, this whole family is strange because it's already dynamized, right? And you, you remember that without insulin, the alpha segment is an allosteric inhibitor of the beta segment. And the role of insulin is just to activate or remove the inhibition of the alpha okay. But what actually happens first is, of course, these, um, 
the beta subunit cytoplasmic domain autophosphorylates are actually more accurate cross phosphorylates. And so it's bristling with a bunch of phosphates, specifically on tyrosines. Okay. And actually, what, I, what binds to that is not the bread sauce, but the rock first is actually a, another scaffolding protein. You, you thought that this was enough surface area. It's not. It's a protein that's called uh, in, insulin receptor substrate. And there's various isoforms. We'll just call it IRS. Okay. It really is called that. And what it does is it binds to this. Okay, it actually has, I think, a link to the plasma membrane. And so this is IRS. And then the, the beta subunit phosphorylates this all over the place. So it's got phosphates, tyrosine phosphates all over. And so IRS is just a scaffolding protein that allows other signaling pathways to link to the insulin receptor and branch off. So that's the big deal. The insulin receptor um, has a helper, a scaffolding that gives it more surface area. Also in this family is the insulin-like growth factor okay. uh, receptor. It's, it looks like insulin receptor. It smells like insulin receptor. It's almost the same. IGF is a really important growth factor. In fact, if um, when men secrete testosterone, testosterone makes your muscles get bigger because it binds the skeletal muscle and releases IGF. That's how potent it is. And so insulin is a real muscle builder, cell divider, and dangerous from a cancer standpoint. So the insulin receptor would be a good example of a tumor suppressor or an oncogene. It's an oncogene. You leave it on, and there are mutations in which the insulin receptor and the IGF-1 receptor, particularly IGF is overexpressed in, in prostate cancer, and insulin uh, receptor is overexpressed in breast cancer and a lot of other things, but it is an oncogene. All right, so I just wanted to, to bring that up. Um, so let's go to the cytoskeleton, and clearly it's got a, a lot of important uh, things going on. If you, if you determine cell shape, you determine cell function, right? Uh, cell motility, and we're talking about two types of motility. The cell can uh, move around, or the cell, I mean, the cell can crawl during development, or the cell, like a gamete, can actually uh, can swim, okay? Uh, cell motility also is uh, important about determining fluid flow past that cell type. So the oviduct or floating tube in humans is ciliated, so the, the egg cannot swim, it has no flagellum, and so what it does is the cilia just move it down the oviduct. Okay? Uh, it doesn't have to go very far because the uh, sperm is so much, right? And that's because they have a flagellum that is driven by those guys, micro, uh, sorry, microtubules. Right? So cell movement, cell shape, uh, component trafficking, you know, all the organelles we've been talking about, Golgi, ER, vesicles, they're, they're not there randomly. They're there because they're riding or hitched, hitched to ride upon the, the, the cytoskeleton. And so these, this network of fibers creates this matrix to which they're attached. Okay. So it gives the cell organization. And of course, if you can't reproduce, you can't be a cell. And cell division is uh, an important function of microtubules to spin the fibers. Okay. So the first real thing is to in fact, this is the biggest thing that you should be able to do for this section, and that is to distinguish among the different fiber types. How are they similar, and how are they different? Well, the obvious difference is where they get their names from. So microfilaments are the smallest in diameter, seven nanometers. Intermediate filaments are intermediate in size in terms of its, di its diameter at eight to 12. And you should be asking yourself, why is it so flaky? You know, it's got eight to 12. Why? Okay, so that's, that's a, a good question to have in mind. And then microtubules are the biggest. In fact, they are a hollow tube that's 20 nanometer, 24 nanometers across. Okay, so size is a, a, a big difference between the three different types of microtubules or uh, fiber types. Okay, so let's go over here and go back to the PowerPoint. Look at some pictures. 
And uh, this is a very uh, did, you, did you know that since 200 years we've known that diseases are not caused by uh, spirits? Oh, okay. okay, I just maybe you didn't know. Um, okay, so this is the first uh, learning goal is to know these differences between the types. And so this is a really nice picture because it shows all three fiber types lit up together. Okay. And what you notice is that they're not superimposable on each other. The green are microtubules and the yellow are intermediate filaments and the red are microfilaments. So what do you notice uh, immediately about those? What's the big difference? Just pick one color and say what the difference is. Yeah. Microfilaments are lining the edges as so. well. Microfilaments are? Lining the edges. The edges, okay, that, that's true. In fact, microfilaments form the cell cortex. The cell actually has an inner rim right underneath the plasma membrane that you already know about. Those are the fibers that to which all those membrane proteins attach to. So most of the, the, the actin, that's the other name for it, the actin cytoskeleton, these red things, form the cell cortex because they're interacting with membrane proteins. So almost all of the, the, the cytoskeleton uh, that's composed of actin is an indirect peripheral membrane protein. So they form the cell cortex right underneath. They also form the actual surface of the cell. We'll look at that in just a moment. Um, notice uh, the green ones. Where do they seem to arise from? If you, if you had to try to pick a point where they're all coming from. It looks like the midwings, right? And that's because there are uh, MTOX, microtubule organizing centers, are located next to the nucleus, And they always tend to go from there to the periphery, always in one direction. Um, Actin cytoskeletal, not so much. It forms branches, it forms bundles, it might do this, it might do that. It's not so predictable. But microtubules is very predictable about where to start. Okay, and then the last one are the yellow ones, and it sort of can't figure out what it's doing. It sort of, sometimes it follows the microtubules, sometimes like this. There's a bridge of uh, microfilaments, and the intermediate filaments are following that same bridge. So it's sort of not sure about what it wants to do. So that's a big difference. All right, so if, if we make the, the statement that these filaments <coughs> create cell shape, you can see why. So this is like a fibroblast, and which way is it crawling? Can you tell? You think it looks like sort of like uh, sort of a bird that looks like it's going to fly that way, right? No, that's not which way it's going. The, you can always tell because of this. This is called a low malopodium. And it's got its claws and its fingers, and it's reaching, it's going this way. And what creates those fingers are the active cytoskeleton that polymerize and deep deform plasma membrane. Because you know the plasma membrane is squishy, right? And so if you polymerize finger bones through it, you create these crawlers that reach out, bind, and, and the back lifts up, and this thing moves forward. It actually contracts and moves, contracts and moves. Okay, so that's crawling, but what if this thing needs to divide? It has to completely rearrange actually all of it, but the real piece that has to be redone is these green fibers, which are microtubules, which are the thickest, the thickest fiber. And so this has to depolymerize into a, a mesh, and then it's got to repolymerize into spindle fibers. And if it can't do that, you can stop the cell from dividing. Okay? And that's actually an anti cancer treatment. So this divides, and there's two things going on here. There's the segregation of chromosomes, and there's the cell splitting, which is called cytokinesis. That, again, is a function of the actin cytoskeleton. There's pinching off those two cells. Cytokinesis is created by a ring of actin that squeezes and contracts, just like your skeleton is. Okay. So it, it can't, the cells can segregate chromosomes without actin, but they can't divide. <coughs> And then it's got to reassemble this mesh into some sort of shape that will allow that cell to do its function. Crawl, smell, breathe, absorb. Okay. 
Now, so let's, let's look at this. Uh, so this is an old friend of ours. This is the intestinal epithelium. This is an enterocyte. This is Bart Simpson. And the reason Bart Simpson with his little beady eyes and his mouth and his hair up here, the reason he has hair is because of the active cytoscope. Remember, the cortex is heavily uh, populated by actin filaments. And if you take those filaments and you go abracadabra, they can be polymerized into bundles. That creates a microvilli that does one thing. It increases the surface area of this, um, uh, this cell, the apical cell. Why do you need surface area facing the gut window? What's the purpose? <laughs> Yeah, and that 90 percent well, that gives you more surface area so that you can absorb nutrients. Are most nutrients absorbed passively? No. Yeah. Yeah. There are co-transporters, there's transporters, there's pumps, there's all kinds of junk. It's standing room only. The extra surface area is required to pack the protein transporters side by side so that you can absorb all those nutrients. That's why you have extra surface area. It's not to passively absorb lipids. So surface area. So this this chef, this cell cannot do its job unless it has a particular shape. Okay. And then look at look at this. The junctions that are important for keeping stuff that you don't want out of your bloodstream, they're tied in to the actin cytoskeleton. And then there's some there's some actual girders, that is strengthening agents. That's what the role of intermediate filaments are. Not so much to traffic things or provide cell shape. It's to keep, resist the cell from being pulled apart. Does your gut move? It's probably moving right now, thinking about this cell. Okay. It has to move. And this, this cell would tear itself apart if it did not resist uh, distortion because it's got intermediate, intermediate filaments. They're really strong cables. Okay, so there's a lot of functional um, um, Characteristics that develop from the fiber types if you use them correctly. Okay, so we're not to we're not going to memorize all the details, but very quickly we want to break the, the fibers into a couple of things. So let's talk about what we want to do is be able to separate all the fiber types. So we've got um, fibers or filaments. It's the same thing. We want to break that into microtubules. Uh, microfilaments and intermediate filaments. Okay, and we've already done one thing. Uh, obviously, diameter is one thing, and I won't go over that again. But that's how they get their name because of their diameter is different. Okay. So the next thing is, what's the uh, the filament type? <coughs> filament type, and that is, what does it really look like? Okay, so. Uh, this is a microfilament. This is actin. This is the monomer of actin. And it is built like a beads on a necklace. So it's like a pearl necklace, okay. strung together. And it look, actually looks like two filaments that are helically wound around each other. It's not. It's just that the, the monomer is attached to each other in a sort of helical fashion. Okay. You can't split this into two strands. It doesn't work that way. Okay. So this is like a bead, a bead, a bead of actin. Okay. And so it, that's its uh, shape. All right. So we can say microfilaments, it's got actin, monomers, okay, that are strung like beads on a string. So that's the, the fiber type. All right. And now we have the cables, and, and that's what you should think of when you think of intermediate filaments. They're the strengtheners, the, the, the girders that hold the building together. Uh, look at how this thing is formed. So you have, this is a, 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 a long alpha helical stretch, and then it dimerizes by forming uh, a parallel coiled coil. So it's got a coil coil motif, and that coil coil dimer forms a tetramer by head to tail uh, polymerization with a second, with a second um, <coughs> dimer. And so this is the fundamental, this tetramer, anti-parallel tetramer is actually the fundamental unit of a uh, intermediate filament. And so you pack those together 
and you take eight of these and you twist it into a, a computer cable, and that forms a intermediate filament. So you see the difference. The, the, fun, the filament type is very different. So this is this is a cable, right? That's the filament type. It's very strong. And so what's good about a cable? If you pull on it, it doesn't go anywhere. It's not distensible. It's strong. It will not pull apart. And that's what we use it for, mostly structural um, support. And then finally, we have microtubules, uh, which actually are the most dynamic <coughs> thing in, this, uh, in terms of the filament types. And it is a form of an alpha beta dimer. Okay, and you stack those end to end, alpha beta, alpha beta, alpha beta, and then you multiply that 13 times, and you have 13 protofilaments that form a hollow tube. So this is a hollow tube. It's like hand towels, that cardboard thing in the middle. It's a hollow tube. Okay, and they can come in singlets. This is a classic singlet with, if you cut across that, look at the cross section. There's 13 protofilaments staring you in the face. Um, so this is a hollow tube, and that's why it's so big, is it's got a hollow center. Right? So we've talked about that, microtubules. Um, what is this? This is a hollow tube. All right? So that's, we know the diameter is different. We know that the, uh, the fiber type is very different. What about nucleotides? Okay, if you notice, most of these filaments are binding nucleotides. The favorite one for tubulin, which is the, the fundamental molecule, instead of actin, it's tubulin, and that tells you where it goes. It goes into the microtubule. All right, is it's both uh, of these subunits, the alpha and the beta subunit, bind GTP. So its favorite nucleotide is GTP. GTP. So this is a GTP binder. Okay. Well, let's go backwards. All right. What about this one? Aha, this is the special one. This is the only filament type, intermediate filaments, that does not bind to nucleotides. No nucleotides. None. Okay. okay. What about actin? Yes, sir. ATP. ATP, the adenine nucleotides, ADP, ADP, ATP is buried right into the center of that actin monomer. Okay. And when it's all by itself, you call that G-active, or globular active. And when it's in a filament, you call it F-active. I don't know why people get confused about that, but one is the monomer and one is the filament. So it's G-active, globular, monomer, F-active, filament, polymer. Okay. So ATP for microfilaments. Okay. All right, so what's another characteristic? How dynamically, so are they stable or unstable? Okay, so we're talking about the dynamic properties. When you say dynamic properties, what do you mean? What, what do you really mean when you say that's dynamic? <laughs> Louisville was very dynamic, and Michigan not so much. Yeah. Change with respect to what parameter? So we do something in. Uh, video microscopy now, and so we can look at X, Y, and Z planes in a cell. So we can go X, Y, and then we can actually focus through the cell and get depth. What's the fourth parameter? Time. If it's a dynamic property, it changes with time. That's the difference. Okay. And so many of these uh, fiber types are very dynamic. That means they grow and they shrink and fall apart. And some of them don't fall apart. So think about the dynamic instability as a fundamental property of these uh, different fiber types. And it has to do with the nucleotide that binds to it. Okay. And so this is a microfilament. And it is, just to confuse some biology students, it's intermediate <coughs> in its dynamic characteristics. It's pretty unstable. Not real unstable. Would you want your skeletal muscles to be unstable? It's kind of like playing, you know. While you work out, no, that's all you're supposed to do, right? So it's it's kind of unstable. It has to be unstable so it can it can polymerize and form those little fingers, the Bart Simpsons and the move the cell around. It has to be dynamic, so it has to change. So it's intermediate in stability, and that's because it binds a nucleotide and can split it. Okay. So being able to split a nucleotide contributes to its instability. Okay. Now let's go forward. 
All right? What do you see? No nucleotide? Is it very dynamic? No. Do you want the girders in a building to be dynamic? No. This is a structural behemoth. It's there to keep the cell from falling apart. So it is not dynamic, and it lacks nucleotides. Okay, so it doesn't have to be dynamic. Okay. And then finally, we have microtubules. These, a typical microtubule has a half-life of 10 minutes. <laughs> it just cannot, it just, it just goes and does other things, right? The only reason it can be stable for longer than 10 minutes, which is kind of good when you're pulling a chromosome, uh, is because it's got proteins that bind to it. Okay, so this is the least stable, and guess what? It has a nucleotide GTP that splits. So this one, microtubules, least stable, intermediate stability, okay. and intermediate filaments, uh, most stable. So really, the, the way you distinguish these are pretty different, and they're, they're really based on their chemical properties. Okay. All right, so what's the last thing? Okay, well, there's two things. Now, um, the um, isoforms. Okay. What is it that gives the microtubules their diversity function? They're pretty diverse. They can carry a vesicle. They can cause, they can pull a chromosome. They can move the cisterna of the Golgi. So what is it that creates those different functions? It's not the isoforms. There's only six to eight isoforms of tubule. Okay, so it's, it's not because there's an isoform that forms vesicles, an isoform that forms the flagellum. There's, that's not the reason it has different function. Okay. Actually, we'll cover two of the characteristics. It's very few isoforms. The diversity comes from the proteins that attach to it. Filament attachment proteins determines the function of microtubules. So if you don't have very many different ways of pulling together, you've only got alpha, beta, alpha, beta, and there's very few isoforms, then the way you get a new function is the proteins you choose to associate with. Okay. The only difference is in cancer. Okay. One of the ways that cancers become resistant to chemotherapy, particularly if you're using uh, an anti-microtubule agent, such as Taxol. Taxol is very effective in, in breast cancer and uh, several uh, ovarian cancer. So it's a, it's a great way to destroy the cancer cell, except the cancer cell has found a way to evade Taxol by displaying a weird isoform, a tumor isoform of tubulin. So that's when the isoforms come into play is when the tumor is trying to escape from the chemotherapy that's trying to destroy it. What it, it doesn't know that, that it's being attacked. All it does is just keep continually mutates until it finds a new tubular molecule that Taxol can't bind to. But that's, that's the exception that proves the rule. Very few isoforms for tubular. Okay, and it's all about, okay, let's go to this one. <coughs> Diversity is all about the proteins that bind to it. Okay. And so let's, this is filaments. Right. So this is like a, a panel in your textbook. So the thing that gives microtubules its diversity of function is all these proteins that bind to it and do different things to the microtubules. You can think of the microtubules as being the highway, and the thing that gives it its diversity is the trucks and the cars and the motorcycles and the people that ride the trucks on them. Okay? So all these different proteins do different things. There's things that, that split it. There's things that grow it. There are motors. There's molecular motors, kinesins you're probably familiar with, that walk along the highway. So diversity is created by microtubule uh, attachment proteins or microtubule uh, affiliated proteins, maps. Okay. All right, and the same is actually true. So let's, let's talk about uh, microtubules, a uh, few isoforms, diversity equals maps, microtubule attachment proteins. 
All right, so what about microfilament since we're there? And there's very few, well, without switching to it, there's very few isoforms of tubule. You don't want a different isoform for every skeletal muscle you have. Smooth. In fact, the same actin monomer is in skeletal muscle as it is in smooth muscle. So very few isoforms. It's the same principle as microtubules. So guess what? The diversity of all the microfilaments comes from microfilament associated proteins, MFAPs. Okay, MFAPs. That's kind of clumsy, so sometimes we just call them actin binding proteins, ABP. So that's where you get the diversity. And let's look at, you go up in this little figure, you have all kinds of, of fiber associated proteins. We have, we have proteins that's, that destabilize them, we have proteins that cause polymerization, you have proteins that cut it, you have proteins that cap it, you have proteins that link it. All kinds of stuff. In fact, let's go back to the PowerPoint and just to get a, a peek at that. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. So, this is an interactome. This is what it's called an interactome. We've seen an interactome before, and that's the interactome that happens during endocytosis. This is the active interactome. It interacts with all these different things. So here's molecular motors. These are involved in, in cutting cells in two. Uh, this is involved in endocytosis. So the actin interactome interacts with the clathrin interactome. So there's interactomes that interact with each other. So it gets really complicated really fast. So that's what causes the diversity of microfilaments is all the diversity of things that bind to it. Well, we can break this rule uh, when we talk about intermediate filaments because guess what? Very few proteins bind to, to intermediate filaments. All right, so very few filament, intermediate filament attachment proteins. Very few. So where does the diversity come from? The one thing that's left is, in fact, isoform. And so let's go back to the, this, and now we can answer this question. Why is this diameter so sloppy? And it's because intermediate filaments have dozens of isoforms. In fact, the way, how can you tell, so the problem about cancer is, in fact, it's not really cancer until it metastasizes. It's actually a tumor until it leaves its site of origin. And so you have a tumor that's growing in the brain. Does that mean it started there? No, it could have started in the, the GI tract. How do you know where it started? You can actually take that sample of the tumor and you can put it on a slide and stain it for different antibodies and look for the specific type of intermediate filament. And it will have gut intermediate filaments there. Because it, even though a cancer cell is very unstable, it keeps its good old intermediate filaments. Because even that thing, you may have one leg and one eyebrow but its intermediate filaments are there, or else it's not going to survive. Okay, so um, cell diversity is a function of the, uh, lots of fiber uh, diverse isoforms in intermediate filaments. And nobody else but much wants to bind to it. There's not very many friends of intermediate filaments. Okay. And so we talked about all these different things. And just uh, if we go back to Let's get those on one of these slides. Oops. Okay, this is just an example. And I, I didn't bring my uh, disc, but there's some good movies on your DVD that shows this kind of change dynamic property um, with microtubules, which are, of course, the least stable. Okay, and so you follow number one. Okay, so this is at zero time, and yeah, I think you can see it. Uh, and so after 125 seconds, this thing collapses. That's actually a process called catastrophe. When this thing falls apart, like that video I showed the first day, that thing that was unpeeling, 
that was a microtubule. And then it goes catastrophe, and those, those protofilaments just peel apart, right? Okay. And then by 307 seconds, it's actually reborn. It's actually grown larger, and then it's gotten shorter again. So this thing's up and down and up and down, so it's very dynamically unstable. Why? Because it's able to split the nucleotides. Okay. All right. Okay, so we know the basic difference between these different fiber types, uh, and I'm just showing different characteristics. Uh, we want to be able to um, distinguish how you control microtubule assembly because controlling these fibers is the name of the game. Okay, and the assembly for microtubules is very different in um, in vitro compared to in vivo. Right? So here is a plot of actin, and although we're, we're talking about, uh, we're going to start talking about microtubules first, it's the same for microtubules and actin because they both bind nucleotides. And so there's always three phases in the polymerization of any of these films. There's a lag phase, there's the nucleation phase, that's the slowest. That is, in, in a test tube, the slowest step to growing the fiber is to get it started, nucleation. Okay? And then there's the elongation phase. This is kind of like making a protein. You know, there's an elongation of the ribosome, moving down mRNA. Uh, that's, here, that's fairly fast. Okay? And then it reaches this plateau. And that plateau is called the critical concentration. And that plateau is reached when the filament is in a steady state. It's still dynamic. What's happening is the rate of addition of subunits is the same as the rate of loss of subunits. Okay. That's, what, that's why it's not growing. Things are still being pulled off and things are being added, but the addition rate is the same as the subtraction rate. That's called the critical concentration because it's the concentration of monomers that determines that phase. Okay. If you increase it, it can go past that, it has a different critical concentration by changing the concentration, in this case, of actin, or in the case of microtubules, of uh, tubule. Okay, but this isn't how it works in you and I. If we had to sit there and wait for the lag phase for an actin filament to grow, we'd all be flabby. I mean, we are a little bit flabby, but it would be even worse. We'd just be a pool of protoplasm. It's too long. So what controls it in vivo? Proteins control it. So those binding partners are going to speed it up, slow it down, cut it, build it, stabilize it. So it's the proteins. This is completely bogus in terms of what controls filament polymerization and depolymerization in vivo. All right, so we're going to go back and we're going to focus on uh, microtubules and Let's do that after the break. And some of these groups need to meet and decide what they're going to do. Okay, so let's do that right now. Okay, so um, we're going to focus on microtubules for a bit. And uh, let's go to PowerPoint and do that. We've already talked a little bit about it, so you should know the basic um, structure. Okay, so the, the way this thing works is it is alpha tubulin and beta tubulin are separate proteins. As soon as they come off the, the ribosome, they have no signal peptide. So where are they going? They are cyto cytoplasmic. Okay? They may associate with membranes, but they do not. They're not membrane proteins uh, integral. Okay, so they're made in the cytoplasm. As soon as they're made, they stick together. And if you take these uh, alpha tubulin and beta tubulin, <laughs> And you string them out, okay? Um, let's let's do that here. And you string them out in terminus to C terminus. They have a particular shape to them. They've got towards the um, towards the in terminus for both alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. So we got beta here, in. and they obviously evolve from one another. Okay, they, near the in terminus is the GTP binding domain. Okay. So they both bind GTP. The difference is the beta subunit can split GTP. So this is a GTP ace. The alpha subunit never splits GTP. So that's a big difference. Okay. And that makes the alpha 
uh, tubulin kind of uh, a bystander rather than the one that's controlling stability. <coughs> So that's the N-terminus. What's sort of in the middle, uh, the middle of the thing? Well, there's a, this is where colchicine binds. It's a hard word to spell. C-O-L. And colchicine is famous because it's been used since Egyptian times. They, they, it's a plant product. And a little bit of colchicine will treat a lot of diseases like gout and some other kinds of diseases. Uh, a lot of colchicine will kill you. So it's dangerous. Uh, and what's also interesting about colchicine is the FDA made some deal with some pharmaceutical company. And they said that pharmaceutical company uh, didn't want to make colchicine. And uh, colchicine was really, was really cheap. It was about uh, nine cents a tablet. Nine cents a tablet. And they made a deal. They said, we'll make colchicine if you give us exclusive rights to colchicine. Synthesis. And the stupid FDA did, colchicine now costs $5 a tablet. Guess what the profit margin is on colchicine right now? It's not called colchicine, it's called cold Chris. I wouldn't recommend buying it. For a three month supply, it's about $800. And there's lots of people that depend on colchicine. So, talk about the pharmaceutical company. Anyway, so, that's just, sorry. Uh, All right, what does it do exactly? What colchicine does, and we'll, we'll talk about it, but the way it poisons, it's a microtube of poison, and if colchicine binds to the alpha subunit, and then the alpha beta subunit carrying colchicine binds to a microtubule, you can't add anything else. It blocks the polymerization. What's that going to do to your spindle fiber? It's going to stun it, right? So it's trying to polymerize. And they actually go out and they're searching for chromosomes. If you can't search, you can't find. Okay? So that's why colchicine is, is actually what they've done is they've taken that structure and fooled with it and uh, turned it into a cancer treatment. Okay? So anyway, so colchicine, and then what's at the C term? Must be something in the C terminus, and this is where the maps lie. The maps and calcium. Okay? So, and that's for both of them. So C terminus. Uh, Microtubule associated proteins, interverts GTP, and for alpha subunit colchicine drug. Okay. So you put those together and you have an alpha tubulin uh, dimer. That is the unit of polymerization. And what's really cool is this always polymerizes beginning with the alpha end pointed in one direction. So it's the minus, it has a minus and a plus in it. The minus n is defined by the alpha subunit. So it's alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. The alpha is the negative n, and the plus n is, is the beta n. So alpha is minus, beta is uh, plus. What does that stand for, plus minus? What it really means is the plus means that the rate of polymerization and depolymerization is faster. So the plus n is more unstable than the back end, the negative end. That's the big deal. So subunits add, added both ends, but the rate of addition is faster at the plus end than the minus end. And the rate of removal is faster at the plus end than it is at the minus end. So everything's kind of happening at the plus end. That causes it to grow unidirectionally instead of going over here or there and out the back end. And that's why it can, it can start at the mic, like, uh, microtubule organizing center is always associated with that minus n right there. So there's going to be a protein that we'll get to in here in just a moment that's going to associate and nucleate that and speed up the lag phase. So there is no lag phase. Okay, so this is going to grow, but it doesn't grow with one protofilament and the next one next to it. It grows as sort of a ring like this and then they associate side to side. So this grows sort of as a barrel going up, okay? And goes up like this. Um, now, what controls the stability? This is a big question. And it's controlled, as you have surmised, by the nucleotide hydrolysis. Which subunit can split GTP? Only the beta, only the beta. And here's the rule. As long as you have a beta subunit that's exposed to the plus end, it's bound to GTP. We call that a GTP cap. As long as your plus N is capped with GTP, two or three, two or three of these divers or even more, this thing is going to keep growing. 
Well, what happens is if the rate, and so the polymerization rate begins to, to occur as soon as the alpha betas come together, all right? And so back at the negative end, this is where you started somewhere here, you went alpha, beta, alpha, beta. And so the rate of hydrolysis uh, is such that it's, it's creeping forward, right? And eventually, if you quit adding alpha, beta dimers, the rate of hydrolysis is gonna catch up to the plus end. And when it does, what's happening is when you split GTP, it starts to put a curve in that protofilament. You see it curving? Okay, and if you put too much curve in there, it's going to fall apart. That's going to cause what's called catastrophe, depolarization. It's catastrophe, and so it's going to go boom and, and fall apart. It makes that sound good, just boom. Okay, and then it'll grow right back very quickly as long as you can add new dimers with what property? GTP is bound to the alpha and the beta. The alpha does never touch GTP. The beta is the control of the computer. Okay, but if if the rate of polymer uh, of GTP hydrolysis catches up with the rate of addition, so you get to the very end and you blow off the GTP cap, and this dimer is exposed at the end with GDP, it's going to fall apart. So that controls the stability of a microtubule, and this this kind of shows that. So there's that GTP cap. These guys have all slowly hydrolyzed their GTP in the beta subunit, and so it's caught up here, but it hasn't quite reached the edge, right? It's, it's trying to get there, but the minute one of these things, like this one right here, looks like it's real vulnerable because there's only one, two, two dimers that, that have GTP. When this, these two split, split, and you haven't added a new one onto it, it's going to do this. It'll just unfold. That's called catastrophe. And we know exactly what it is. And there's videos of this. Okay, okay so we want to, the, the Learning goal that we have now is to understand the roles of how do you how do you make one of these happen? How do you um, cause it to polymerize? What are some rules and roles of mass? Okay, and then why would we make an anti tumor drug? Well, we we talked a little bit about that. Okay, so uh, this is Taxol. This is an anti tumor drug. Uh, this is uh, even more effective than colchicine and, and its uh, population of drugs. It's actually um, uh, produced by the Western yew tree. I'm going to be in Seattle in about six weeks, and so this stuff grows all over the place. I don't recommend eating this. If you make a salad of this, you will, you will die. Okay, it's very lethal. Uh, the problem is the, um, the taxol is actually produced in the bark. And when they discovered taxol, they cut down a bunch of Western yew trees, which is not very bright. And because um, you have to, when you cut the, the trunk and you take the bark off, what, is, what happens to the tree? It dies, okay? So finally, they, what they found is that they could take the leaves and chemically convert a preform of taxol into taxol, and all, now they do is strip the leaves. They try not to take all of them, but they can make taxol, and it makes it a lot, a lot cheaper. Okay. So this is what taxol does. So here's a nice, this is a cell. And uh, before it's exposed to taxol, it's got a nicely developed microtubule um, population emanating from the nucleus, which would be right here in the center. You add taxol, and this is what happens. What happens is taxol blocks the ability of the GTPase and the beta subunit to split GTP. So guess what? You can only do one thing. You can only elongate. And you go, well, that's not so good. Uh, a tumor cell needs to build these elongated spindle fibers. But you look like this before you go into mitosis. You're going to have to depolymerize all of these to arrange them into an orderly spindle. Is that an orderly spindle? <coughs> no, you cannot form spindle fibers in the presence of taxol. And unless you're a stupid tumor that becomes resistant to taxol and starts making some weird form of tubulin that will not bind taxol. And then that patient's dead. Okay, so where do you grow out if you're going to be a microtubule? Well, it's going to be somewhere near the nucleus, and it happens to be the centrosome. That's an organelle. It's not a membrane-bound organelle. It's sort of a, we're, that's where the centrioles are, and they're arranged as sort of um, per anti -per perpendicular little short tubes. And the centrioles are actually made out of. Uh, triple barrel 
microtubules. They don't have one protofilament. They don't have two. They have three. Okay, and that's what that makes them very characteristic. But that's not where the micro. You think, well, you have this triple barrel thing, so all the microtubules must grow out of it. No, that's not what nucleates it. It's the proteins that associate with the paracentriols. So the centrosome has a matrix that surrounds the centrioles, but the main protein is the gamma tubulin ring complex. That's the nucleator. And this is, I told you there's not really any isoforms. This is one of the weird isoforms. It's gamma tubulin. It's not the one that the tumor makes. But you put this, see, this is the structure. And it's already got kind of a half ring or almost a full ring. And so it's actually helping not only each protofilm to grow out, but to form a ring. And so the, the beta uh, tubulin ring complex, the beta turf, as, it, as it's known, is located in the centrosome near the centrioles. And so they're all going to nucleate. Remember, this, if I showed you a picture on a test and I said, which subunit is this? It's got to be the alpha subunit that's touching the, the beta, uh, the gamma turf uh, ring complex, because it always starts Minus, or for the minus thing grows out, so it's alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. And on the end of this, this is always, always, always the beta subunit. Okay. All right, so you call these uh, MTOCs, if, you're, if you know, if you're in the uh, cell biology, you call them MTOC, this is for short, MTOC. Okay. And so MTOCs are places where you can nucleate a um, microtubule. And typically, that's done near in the centrosome, and so they they grow out. And the positive end is always aimed at the plasma membrane. Okay, what if you want to make a flagellum? Let's say you're building a sperm. Okay, and the sperm gets very it's a, it's a weird cell, as we all know. And uh, but let's let's pretend that it's a circle. Okay, and you got a nucleus, but it's going to have some deformation of the membrane. So actually the plasma membrane is actually going to poke out, okay? So the flagellum is enclosed in the membrane. I don't know if you knew that or not. It's not just raw microtubules. But what happens is there's an MTOC right here, okay? And it's called a basal body, okay? And that, how do you know it's a basal body? If you do a section through it in an electron micrograph, it's got triple barrel um, rings, A, B, so it's got rings like this. Instead of a protofilament like this, and if I divided this up correctly, it would have 13, okay? But the, if you do a cross-section through a basal body, it's got a half, a, a partial ring, like a little C structure, and this has 11, and then it, so it's got an A, a B, and a C tubule. And so it's, it's like a triple barrel shotgun. And these, the, the B and the C rings are, have 11 protofilaments, not 13. Okay. So it, it, the, the reason it's useful to know that is if you, you see a microscope and it's got these three things, you're either at the centrosome and the centriole or you're at a baseline. And what will happen is this will polymerize out from this and create this double barrel. So if you cut through the flagellum, of a sperm or through a cilium, it's a double barrel. It's got an A and a B ring. So that's how you can tell whether you're in a flagellum or you're in the basal body or you might be in the centrium. Now, what is a, a cytoplasmic? What's the typical Joe Blow cytoplasmic uh, look like if you cut through it? It's a singlet. It's a singlet. Most microtubules are singlets. Only these special guys. So those are all singlets. But if you cut through those centrioles right there, if you just hack through that, it have triple barrels. Okay. And it's the same same rule here is this yeah, it's, it's a nice picture. So here's central uh, centrioles and so there's the triple barrels that are arranged. I think it's a it's a nine set of bar uh, triple barrels, okay, that makes a centriole and they're linked together by various proteins. Um, here, this is sectioning through right here, right there, okay? It's double barrels if you're on column of the flagellum, okay? 
double barrels. All right. Um, okay. So that's how you nucleate. You use these uh, MTOX. Now, let's talk about the, the various kinds of maps. And there's, there's many different kinds of maps. And we're going to focus on two, two different ones. And we're going to spend almost all of our time on, on this one here. And this is a microtubule associated protein. Okay. And these bind to uh, microtubules. Um, and they have two parts. They have the microtubule binding domain, which is positively charged. They have some lysine or something. I think there's about three or four residues there on that little purple thing. And they have a projection domain. Okay. And the role, these two um, maps are found in neurons. And they create the axon diameter because that projection domain says the next microtubule has to be over here. That's your yard, and this is my yard, and you have to stay over there. Okay? It's a projection domain, and it keeps the microtubules from clumping together. Why do you need to keep these apart? So this is, this is an axon. They're, you're, this is a cross section through, so you have, so you have a cell body, right? For, and then you have dendrites that are communicating with other axons, right? And then you have something like this. And then you have an axon terminal where all that traffic goes on with the neurotransmitters, okay? So this is an axon right here. And let's say you're, you're gonna make a vesicle. So the Golgi is here. The Golgi is up in this, this part. The nucleus is up here, so this is the cell body. But you need to send neurotransmitters down here. How are you gonna get those neurotransmitters down to the axon terminal? vesicle and it's filled with acetylcholine. How are you going to get it? Is it going to diffuse? That's a long way. And some of these are the length of your leg. If you, had, if you had to wait for a vesicle to diffuse, you would be dead. Okay. So what we use is a highway. And that highway is made out of microtubules. And then we're going to take a motor protein and uh, it's going to actually walk along the microtubules. So the reason you need this spacing is because there's traffic coming in and out. There's, there's uh, motor proteins that are walking along the microtubule carrying cargo. Sometimes that cargo is a vesicle. Sometimes it's a whole mitochondria. But if this is all crushed together, the traffic can't go. It's like, it's like LA, which is you know, crushed all the time. Okay? You need to, it needs to be more like water. You know? And so you've got spacing so the traffic can go up and down the microtubule. Right, so the projection domain determines the space. Okay? And so this one has a much shorter um, projection domain. In fact, it has two microtubule binding domains. It's called TAU, T-A-U, which is hidden by that thing. And um, that TAU is interesting because it's in a different, slightly different type of axon. The first discernible um, evidence that a person has Alzheimer's is that these TAUs start to bind to themselves. They're called paired helical fragments. Paired helical fragments. Instead of binding to microtubules, they bind to themselves. Okay? And when that happens, all kinds of stuff happen. You can imagine, if you're not controlling the spacing between the microtubules, what's going to happen? You're going to stop traffic. That axon is going to swell, and that nerve is going to die. Somebody had a question. You just answered it. Okay, good. Um, so, paired helical fragments are the first evidence of uh, Alzheimer's. And it's, we don't know if this causes Alzheimer's or it's the result of something else that causes Alzheimer's and then causes the fragments. But you can tell how important these maps are because they determine whether the, the neuron dies or doesn't die. All right, so one good way to get this map to let go of the microtubule and destabilize. So if you take the map off, it's going to destabilize the microtubule and you can rebuild it into a different highlight, right? Like a, a, a uh, spindle fire, for example. So you have to phosphorylate this. And the reason you need to phosphorylate it is that neutralizes those positive charges on the microtubule binding domain. And instead, it neutralizes them. And so this thing will lift off. So that's actually the very first function of MAPK. You know, we were talking about in the last lecture about MAPK, and 
that was, we thought that it was a microtubule associated protein kinase, and that's all it did. Because MACK will drive a cell into cell division because it phosphorylates all these MACs on the projection domain, and then they destabilize and become a new pool of alpha beta tubulin. And guess what? We reformulate them into spindle fibers. So, and, and I think it's MAP, I forget which one, it's in your, your notes, which I think it's MAP4 is the one that everybody, not, not just neurons, but all cells have MAP4, and that's the one that gets phosphorylated by MAP-K. Okay. But then we found out later that MAP-K phosphorylates a lot of stuff, including transcription factors, and so it's, it's kind of a, uh, a cool pathway. Okay, so uh, any questions other than the one I answered? Yeah, I'm sorry, what does uh, Cal do in um, normal cells? It, it creates the appropriate spacing for that oh, neuron. I thought that was MAP too. Both of them do. Okay. It's just that for some reason this neuron, you know, you can you have different sizes of neurons. You might have this, this the, the, what's the rule? The thicker the neuron, what does that do to conduction speed? So the, the neurons that go from your spinal cord down to your foot, big, okay? So that increases the conduction speed. So you're going to need different projection domains depending on why. Some nerves are just, you know, right there, tiny. Others are large, and so it controls all that function. So you have you can have different kinds of maps. Okay, and that just sort of that finishes this issue. The other type of uh, map that we're going to talk about, not right now so much, but the other type of map I've alluded to, and that's the motor protein. The motor protein is really cool because it, it split, it converts the chemical energy of ATP hydrolysis to the mechanical energy of motion. That's what a, a, a motor protein does. And depending on which one, direction you want to go, you use a kinesin if you want to go to the plus end. And if you want to take a vesicle and send it to the minus end, you use dynamic. It's a really simple formula. So we're going to figure out how this thing works in a, a later class. But motor proteins are a category of mass. Okay, okay now, um, I was going to mention something. What was I going to mention? Oh, the poster session, one, uh, up to three people, but at least one person from each group needs to go to that poster training session on Thursday at 4 p.m. It's in the library. You're going through the atrium there with the water and everything. And when you go through the, those glass doors, you, you take a right. And you see this big, large TV thing. That's the teaching and learning center. And so you go in there, and you kind of bear to the right, and go on around um, and find room 151. You'll see bunches of computers, and you just go along there. That's 4 p.m. this week. It, it won't last long. It's just there to get everybody familiarized with the templates, where they are, what you're going to do with it, you know, in case you have it. How many people have made a poster before with, with PowerPoint? It's actually pretty easy because you just move things around. And so that, that's not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is to squeeze all your information off your poster. Okay. Did you have a question? Uh, yes. You said that you might two times to use No, it's just, just one. one time, but you can have up to three people, but you need at least one person from your group to show up. And the other thing, oh, so um, I guess I'm, we're only going to have one group that's going to dissolve. Um, and that group needs to rank, for the midterm rank, you go ahead and, and rank your original group, but then you're going to be in a new group. So uh, that group will be split, and it's going to join your other guys. The problem is, you know, you're already doing your own uh, poster project. They're going to have to do what you guys do. And so it's, what you should not do is, and final, the, the final ranking of your group members, you, you shouldn't dock those people because they didn't get to do the first half of the class with you. You should treat them as starting from today. It, it, it's not their fault that half the group fell apart. Okay. So rank your own group. Don't rank these new people. If your, your group is dissolved, if you just rank your original members. Okay. All right, so let's just let's do a couple of problems. And <clears throat> pull out your clickers. Again, this is all about getting ready for the final exam. So.
guys did do uh, Congress and so get those questions. Okay, so let's do question number eight. Let's do it as an individual. question is actually even easier than it has to be because I tell you the cell type. Remember there's two cells that are talking to each other so this actually gives you even more information than you actually need. Okay, 68, let's take just a few more either know or you know. Thank you. 
Okay, let's just, yeah, do something.